very good evening to you all folks the lord be with you and also folks it's so great to see so many out in what was quite a, a bit of a foggy evening and so i'm so grateful that you've all come out for our carol service uh, this evening um, just a couple of notes just to bring to your attention before we begin and the first is um christmas day our nativity service will be happening at half past ten where we'll be showing our virtual nativity where some of our young people and those who are more young at heart have been uh, preparing uh, the nativity which has been put together by play every year so that video will be will be shown on christmas day so if you're able to come you'd be so so welcome to join us for that um, but if not we're going to be having a christmas songs of praise service on sunday the 26th so on boxing day or st stephen's day at 11 a.m which is going to be a time just to come together and join in some some, some uh, christmas carols and hymns of praise as we share in this joyful season and then the other thing just to make you aware of is on friday the 31st of december at 8 p.m we're going to be having a new year's eve service that'll be happening in the uh, traditional church building and it's a service just to reflect on the year that has passed and also to give hope for the year that's ahead. And there also the opportunity for a cuppa and a chat afterwards. And so again, if, if, you're, if you're free and you're around able to come to those services, I do warmly invite you to come along. But as we gather here this evening, I just want to open with a couple of scripture verses. The first from Isaiah chapter 9. Well, the prophet writes, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And a couple of verses from Luke chapter 1. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And so if you're able, I ask that you stand as we sing together our opening carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. <laughs>
the folks, I do invite you to take your seats. So we come now to the lighting of our Advent wreath. And if I had a bit more prepared, I would have actually had all the candles in it, which helps. So Advent, the season of preparing is nearly over. Our waiting is nearly finished. Now is a time of fulfilment and celebration. And so in the darkness of night, we give thanks for light. And so we light this first candle of hope. <coughs> Congregation responds with a bold yellow type. Hope for ourselves and God's beloved world. We light the candle of joy. Joy. Oh, sorry, this one. We, we light the candle of peace. Yeah. Peace, peace in our hearts and on earth. <coughs> we light the candle of joy. Joy to the world and within our whole being. <coughs> and we light the candle of love. The promise of God's love for us and for all creation. And now the hour has come, the season is fulfilled, and so we light the Christ candle. Light the world. So the peace of the Lord is always with you. And also with you. Let's continue to worship as we sing our next carol.
please do take your seats as John Wiley comes to bring to us our first reading. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 to 5. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears but with righteousness he will judge the needy with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Thank you. 
seats as Ruth comes to bring to us our second reading for this evening. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth.
So let us pray. As we come to a time of prayer, the response in our prayers to God of love, God of glory is, be known among us. <clears throat> and so King of kings, yet born of Mary, you come to dwell among us in great humility. You reveal the great love of God towards us and that we are called to be his people. <clears throat> Come now, give us your peace that we may live to your praise and to your glory. God of love, God of glory, be known among us. <clears throat> In the church that looks for you, among the people who proclaim you, with all who seek to serve you, <coughs> among all who dedicate their lives to you, with all who proclaim that they love you, now with us as we worship you and with the church throughout the world, God of love, God of glory, be known among us. with the nation striving towards the light, with the seekers for freedom and justice, among those who enrich and extend our lives, with all who bring peace on earth, <coughs> with the peoples lost in darkness, and with the nations that are caught up in war. God of love, God of glory, be known among us. In our homes, as we prepare for your coming. In our relationships and in our loving. In our sharing and in our caring. In our actions and our interactions. And now within our community, God of love, God of glory, be known among us. With the outcasts and the poor, with the unemployed and the homeless, among the scorned and the rejected, with the refugees and the stateless, <clears throat> with the persecutors and those who suffer injustice, God of love, God of glory, be known among us. And with all those that we know that are in pain or in sorrow, with all in their illnesses, with all in their anxieties, with all who fear for the future, with those whose life on earth is coming to an end, God of love, God of glory, be known among us. And we join together our prayers to the prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer, as we say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 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 So we come now to sing our next carol, All Creatures of Our God and King.
please do take your seats as we come to our forward reading for this evening, which is from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, beginning to read from verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. He replied, do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Beersheba, and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. So a brief prayer. Father, we pray that the spoken word would be faithful to your written word and that it would lead us to the living word. It was Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so throughout this Advent season, we've been looking or kind of going back to the, to the origins of the Christmas story, which we've been finding out right from the book of Genesis. I write from the beginning, God's plan was always to be with his people, was always to be as Emmanuel, God with us. And we start on the first week of Advent, the Genesis 3 with the fall. Then we went from the, the fall to the flood in Genesis 6. And then last week, he has opened to us God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 through 17. Where God promised to make his name great. And to build a family and a nation through him. And the way that this would be achieved, rather than the rest of the world kind of doing their own thing, they would make them say they would be the ones who would do great things and make a great name. Abraham was to achieve this not through his doing, but by the Lord's doing. 
because Abraham was 75 years old. His wife Sarah was past childbearing age, and so it was kind of impossible if they were to kind of build a nation how that was going to happen. It wouldn't be achieved by their power, but God's power to bring life out of the impossible. That was what was going to be seen in their life. But we've seen that actually that wasn't something that was fulfilled straight away. Abraham had to wait. Now, when you're 75 years old, you probably don't think, I don't have time to be waiting. And yet Abraham had to wait 25 more years until he was 100 years young before Isaac was born. I can't imagine what it would be like to become the parent of a newborn at 100 years old, can you? <laughs> and yet, that's what happened to Abraham. I can't imagine that's the way Abraham imagined it would happen. Even God forced me that promise to him. He, can't, he probably didn't imagine, well, I'll be, I'll be another 25 years waiting for this before it will happen. And so in those 25 years, Abraham was to learn again and again and again that he would have to trust and rely on God to fulfill these promises. And as we come to this passage, we're going to see that again. As we come to the last part, part four of looking at Christmas in the beginning, we are going to see that there is a test, but there's going to be trust, but there will also be a provision. So test, trust, and provision. I got to think of it for more beginning with the letter T. <laughs> but we come to the test. Because, that, because the first thing that we, that we learn is the first verse that we read of this passage in chapter 22, verse 1. The first words are, sometime later God tested Abraham. So God comes to test Abraham. You know, it, it, it strikes me that when, when we read this, you know, we know it's a test. Abraham didn't. Or at least we, we are told that he's aware. So I imagine that Abraham doesn't know. God doesn't tell Abraham. Here Abraham I've got a wee test for you. All Abraham knows is that God has come to him. And God has spoken to him. And God has spoken to Abraham many times over the years. So it's not whenever God comes. And this time Abraham thinks there's much reason for alarm. And so which is why when God calls out to Abraham... Abraham replied as he did every other time, here I am, here I am. God calls and Abraham answers. But then comes the test in verse 2, where Abraham is told, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. If we were to go back and look at the original call of Abraham, there's actually quite a lot of similarities there. In both instances, there's this call to go. In both instances, they are called, Abraham is told to leave all his security, leave all of his comfort behind. In both instances, they're also told to go without really knowing the final destination. In both instances, God tells Abraham to go to the place, I will show you. In other words, in most instances, Abraham has been asked to make his heart's dearest objects, the things that would have been the most precious to him, are to become an offering to God. When God first calls Abraham in Genesis 12, those things are more general, where he was called to go and leave everything. He was told to give up his friends, give up most of his family. He was giving up a life in a civilised, in a safe place. He basically just told, go, and I'll show you where you to go. Those are major sacrifices. But God was asking him to trust in his promise. That, that, that this promise God makes to him was to be his security. This promise God gives to him was to be his significance. Not, not everything else. And yet again, God comes, but even in a more stark way. And does it again as he tells him to give up Isaac. What was undoubtedly the dearest thing in his life. Because the ultimate nature of this test is summed up in the term that God deliberately uses with emphasis. It's like each time he says it, it gets stronger. He says, your son, your only son, whom you love. And they will each repeat the magnitude of what has been asked grows. But God says, Abraham, I want, to take, I want you to take your son. But not, but not just your son, but your only son. 
And in fact, not just your only son, but the only son whom you love. Now, if we know or even um, listen to Hazel last week, we know that Isaac is literally not Abraham's only son. Because he also had a son with uh, Sarah's, his wife's servant, a woman called Hagar, and that son was called Ishmael. But the difference that God is making here is that Isaac is Abraham's only son in a sense that all of his hopes are focused in him alone. Isaac was to be the one through whom the nation would be built. He was the one through that hope was to be focused on. And so as God comes to Abraham again and again, he says, give up this and wait for the promised son. Give up that and wait for the promised son. Abraham has given up a lot. He's given up all his other securities, the rest of his family. He left his nephew lost. He left his home, all for the sake of this promised son. All his hopes was placed on Isaac. Even back in chapter earlier, chapter 21, God calls Abraham to give up Ishmael. And he certainly loved Ishmael. But he's told to give him up for Isaac's sake. Which meant now that Ishmael was gone, Isaac was everything to Abraham. Isaac is the one that he's given up absolutely everything for. So Isaac's everything to him. He was the centre of his, his, his emotional life to the point that everything that, that, that would have happened to Isaac, I imagine that Abraham kind of took it as happening to him as well. Abraham has really put all of his eggs in the one basket here. And that basket was called Isaac. Because he's, he's 100 years old. He's given up nearly everything for this. If this thing with Isaac doesn't, doesn't pan out, he's, he's got nothing left. But there's an even greater test here because Isaac essentially was the salvation that God had promised. God had promised to make Abraham a great nation which in that culture where family and descendants was really the greatest possible legacy that you could have. So Isaac for Abraham was the living proof that he was actually right to follow God. As he gave up everything, as he sacrificed everything, as he offered everything, people might have said, Abraham, you're mad. Abraham, why do you keep doing this? He says, well, here's my proof that God is faithful. I have my son. I have Isaac, the promised child that I've waited for for so long. And so the test, unbeknownst to Abraham, that God is giving him is this. Abraham, will you still trust me even when it looks like death? Will you still follow me even when it looks like there is nothing in it for you. <clears throat> Abraham, do you love me more than your son? Because this command is actually much more horrifying to Abraham than just a child sacrifice, so that is certainly something to be detested. Because this command looks like God forsaken us. It looks like God has given him this child and, I was, and has given him this promise and now after so long just taking everything away. And so as God gives him this test, the test is basically, what, what, what will Abraham do? What's he going to do? That's the test. But that brings us then to our second point, which is to the trust. <clears throat> because that, that's what's at stake. Will Abraham remain faithful? Some commentators on this passage even kind of question if it's right that Abraham should remain faithful. Some question, well, Abraham should break the commandment. He shouldn't sacrifice his son. God should never ask a thing like that. Because the question is asked, well, does God have the right to take life? It's very, very reminiscent to the book of Job. He's thought to be the innocent, righteous sufferer. who loses everything, who even loses his family. And then he says in, 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 in verse 21 of chapter 1, The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So I think Abraham understood something of that. He understood that something of the promise that came to him was a result of God's grace. He understood that all that he had was a result of God, not, not because of his greatness, not because of anything he did. God just came and spoke to him. 
and said, Abraham, go. It's not that Abraham was actually seeking God at that point when God first came to him. It's God came to him. And then Isaac came as a miracle because Sarah was far beyond childbearing age. She couldn't normally have a child. And so the promise came from God. Isaac's birth was brought about by God. And now God is asking Abraham to give Isaac up. That's why we read in verses 3 through 8. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Now there's two things of interest in that. The first is that after travelling three days, they arrived at the mountain that God wanted them to go. And so Abraham turns and he says to his servants, wait here with the donkeys. You wait here, myself and Isaac are going to go over there and worship, and then we're both going to come back. Now we might ask, what's going on there? Is Abraham just flat out lying to these servants? Because he doesn't want to really tell them what's about to happen. And the answer to that is no. That's not what's going on. But because it's shown in the next interaction. Because while we don't know exactly how old Isaac is, we do know he's at least old enough to start thinking for himself. He's at least start putting kind of the bits of the pieces together. Because he, he realised that if his dad's telling the truth when they're going to worship, Worship involves a sacrifice. And sacrifice involves usually having an animal. And so when they left, they brought sticks. But only sticks. So how's the sacrifice going to work? And so as he voices his question to his dad, Abraham, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? I imagine the sweat must have been just dripping down from Abraham at that point, in which we absolutely kind of just absolutely kind of fearful and afraid of thinking, what do I how do I answer this? But he replies, God himself will provide the lamb. Is he dodging the issue? Is he dodging the question? No. Because the phrase God will provide more, more literally means God will see to it. When Isaac asked, where's the lamb? Abraham's reply is, God will see to it. God will see to it. I'm about to show my age here, but uh, I wonder has anyone ever read or seen The Little Engine That Could? See a few faces nodding out there in the crowd, which is, which is good. Um, I, I, I must admit, I loved that film as a child, absolutely loved it. I must have watched it kind of every, every day, I'd say, for months on end. Because the, the kind of main story is about this, this kind of little uh, train that goes on this seemingly impossible trip with kind of these heavy carriages behind him. And all see, you know, he's kind of told, well, th- these are too heavy for you to bring. And so initially, kind of stubbornness, he kind of, kind of, goes on and all seems to be going well until he comes to this impossibly steep mountain that's nearly kind of straight up. And he, as he's coming closer and closer, he can, you can kind of question why is, does he, will he be able to get over it? And at the beginning, it looks like he's not because he kind of goes up and then he kind of slides back down, goes up kind of another bit and gets kind of stuck. But does anyone remember the phrase that he says to himself? <clears throat> I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Kind of in line with another, um, you know, and as he I kind of repeats that to himself, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. He gets up to the top and he gets over. Now we might think, well, is that the kind of same attitude that Abraham was going on in his mind as he ascends this mountain of impossibility almost, thinking, I must do it, I must do it. I must do it. I must do it. I have to obey. I have to obey. I have to obey. I have to 
say that my take on that is absolutely not. Abraham is not just kind of going by kind of, kind of willpower or some kind of mantra in his head because he was trusting that God would see to it that a lamb would be provided. In other words, as Abraham set out on this journey, it was a journey of faith. He didn't know how. He didn't know exactly how it would happen, but he was placing his trust in the goodness and in the promises of God that despite all of the appearances, he didn't know how God would provide, he just trusted that God would. He knew God was good. He knew God was faithful. He had experienced that in his life for 25 years. He said, I don't know how God's going to do it, but I trust that he will do it. He was simply saying, God will provide somehow. In other words, he didn't go up the mountain saying, I can do it like the, engine, like the little engine that could, filled with willpower, this kind of self-talk. Rather, he went up the mountain saying, God will do it, but I don't know how. But God will do it. Which isn't to say that Abraham went kind of skipping up the mountain, or went up the mountain with a light heart. I imagine it was still agony. We get a picture of this, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament gives us an insight in this, where they wrote in chapter 11, verse 19, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Now, it's probably close to impossible for Abraham to have a fully worked out theology of resurrection at that point. But he trusted that God would not abandon the promise that he had made and somehow he would yet bring life out of death in this situation. And so when Abraham goes forward, when he climbs the mountain, when he builds an altar, when he places the wood on it, as he binds Isaac, his son, and he lays him on it, and as he's about to bring down the knife, it's then that an angel of the Lord calls out and tells him, do not lay a hand on the boy. Don't do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Can you imagine for a moment the confusion that must have been in Isaac's mind at that time? As he submits to being bound, the fear in his eyes as he sees his father raising the knife. And then suddenly there is a voice, don't do anything to him. Now I know you trust God. That's what the test was about. God actually never intended for Isaac to die. Because there's only two outcomes to the test. Either Abraham would obey and God would intervene, or he would disobey and he would do nothing. But either way, Isaac, Isaac was going to live. Because what's going on is, much like whenever there's a new drug, or there's a new vaccine, or there's a new, or even something like a new theory, it needs to be part of the test to see if it can be dependable. <clears throat> To see if it's actually something that's reliable. Sometimes even in our own lives we test ourselves just to, in order to find our limits, in order to know our own capabilities, don't we? This is exactly what God is doing to Abraham. He tests him by putting him in a situation where he had to trust God to provide. Where he had to trust God to have his best interests in mind. And he puts him into such a situation where it's difficult to believe these things are true. And yet he still asks Abraham, will you still trust me and believe me? And so it's interesting if you go, if we were to go back to Genesis chapter 3, with Adam and Eve in the garden. It's much kind of the same test. God puts them in a garden and basically tells them, you, can, you know, you can, you can eat from whatever you want, but you can't eat from one particular tree. God gives them a command, he gives them something to do. But where Adam failed, Abraham succeeded. Because Abraham believed and trusted in God. Both were given a test to demonstrate whether, whether they truly loved God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength. Abraham didn't, or Adam didn't, Abraham did. Abraham shows by this that he loves God more than anything. 
Ultimately, Abraham shows in his actions that he was not in a relationship with God just for what he could get out of it. Rather, he was in a relationship with God because he got God and he loved God. That was the test. God was t- testing Abraham. What's really the most important thing in your life, Abraham? What's, what's really the chief thing in your life? What is the thing that you love most? So Abraham was given a test to which he responded, not with blind faith, but trust in God that he was good, even when the circumstances said otherwise. Because that brings us now to the last point, which is the provision. Because it's interesting that when Abraham hears this voice, he he doesn't actually see the person who's speaking. He, he, He only hears it. But as soon as, in in verse 13, Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns, he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering to his son. So Abraham hears the voice, don't lay a hand on your son. He looks up, and the first thing he sees is a ram in a bush. Now it's striking, isn't it, that once... Abraham believed that God was able to provide a substitute for Isaac, that it's then that he sees the ram. He trusted in God's provision. He trusted in God's provision, and God's provision was made known to him. And unlike this, like every other passage that we've looked at from Genesis in this series, it's in this that we again see Jesus. Because whatever forsakenness Abraham might have experienced or felt in that command from God, God intervenes. But it was on the cross when Jesus cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God remained silent. Because many years after Abraham and Isaac, there would be another son who would go up those very same mountains. You can read that and see that in 2 Chronicles chapter 3. Because Jerusalem and the temple were built on Mount Moriah. And it was there that the true Isaac would be laid again on wood. But this time there would be no one to intervene. The Apostle Paul understood the true meaning of this when he deliberately applied uh, this kind of language to Jesus in Romans chapter 8. I know Hazel said last week, she quotes Romans 8 a lot, I'm going to do it again this evening. Um, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? I'm just going to read that again. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? all things. In other words, when Paul looks on the sacrifice of the Son, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, he's telling us that when you look at that, it's then that you can say to God, now I finally know that you really love me. Now I get the depths of your love for me. Because God, you did not withhold your Son from me. You did not withhold your Son, your only Son, whom you love from us. God, you didn't withhold that from us. Because what we've been discovering in this series through Genesis is is that although sinful Adam and sinful humanity rebelled against God and constantly chose just to live by their own rules, live by their own principles, live by their own values rather than God's, and although God is just by throwing them out of the garden, by throwing them out and away from his presence, His compassion and his commitment to his creation is such that he does not abandon them forever. Which is why even back right in chapter 3 he promises to send the serpent killer. And as why despite humanity's continued evil and the grief that that brings to the heart of God, God yet still chooses to make a covenant with Noah as a sign that every time he sees it, God will remember that his plan to rid the world of all of the darkness, all of the evil, all of the suffering, all of the sin, is to fire the bow of judgment at himself rather than the world. 
You know, because that word covenant is as binding as a marriage. It is like whenever God makes those promises and makes those covenants, he's basically saying, yes, this is till death do us part. Because God says, yes, I'll even die for you. I'll die for you. And so what I hope we are beginning to discover is that the Bible is really all about Jesus. Not just the New Testament, not just the old part of the Old Testament, but it is all pointing towards Jesus. Because Jesus is the new and the better of him. He's the new and the better humanity. In himself he exemplifies what it means to be human, what it looks like to be human. And he comes to crush the serpent's head. He is the new and the better Noah who provides the ark that shatters us from God's judgment. And he is the new and the better Abraham because he is the one who will fulfil that covenant that is made in verse 18. Where it says that through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. And he is the new and the better Isaac because he is the one that is slain for us. You see, God has provided everything that we need in Jesus. And so like Abraham, when we look up, when we see his provision for us in Christ, who is the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world, we will find a hope and we will find a joy that goes beyond any Christmas tree, any other Christmas present. Because when we trust in the provision of Jesus, we gain the creator of the cosmos as our father. We gain the saviour of the world as our brother. And we gain the Holy Spirit as our power and our comforter. And so I want to finish with these words from, from a well-known Christmas carol. And I hope that they become our prayer this Christmas. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. O oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you that you have come down. Lord, we thank you that you are Emmanuel. That you are the God who is with us, you are the God who loves us, you are the God who is for us. That you are the God who has come to save us. So would you come and fill our lives with your light. Would you come and drive back the darkness. Because Jesus was forsaken in our place. We can know that we will never be forsaken by you. Lord, we see that in Jesus on the cross, you hold nothing back from us. You give us every spiritual blessing in Christ. So help us to live as children of the promise. And that as we give ourselves to you and for your kingdom, Lord, that we would truly know that there is no other God but you and there is nothing else that satisfies like you. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Emmanuel. Amen. Amen. So we're going to come now to a closing time of worship as our praise group comes to lead us in singing. Let's stand and sing the Lord's praises together.
please do take your seats as we come to the end of the service and as we leave this place we go out knowing that for all those in Christ carry Christ with them and carry his light within them. And so Lord you are now letting your servants depart in peace according to your word for our eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel, through Christ our Lord. Amen.